Most people think the book of Isaiah is an old musty book. After all, it's 2,800 years old. And it's just about Jewish history. That's not true. The main theme in the book of Isaiah, which is 2,800 years old, the main theme is the cross of Christ. There's more about the cross in the book of Isaiah than any other part of the Old Testament. And perhaps you can say more about the cross than any other part of the New Testament except Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And remember that at the cross the law was magnified, justice was satisfied, sin was nullified, the devil was petrified, God was glorified and humanity was justified. Now that's a series of accomplishments, isn't it? All at the cross. When one reads <coughs> Isaiah 52 and 53, one feels like looking up and saying, my Lord Jesus, the condemnation was thine, that the justification might be mine. The agony was thine, that the victory might be mine. The pain was thine, that the ease might be mine. The vinegar and the gall was thine, that the honey and the sweet might be mine. The crown of thorns was yours, that the crown of glory might be mine. And the death was yours, that the life might be mine. So the cross is of tremendous importance and we should rejoice in this book of Isaiah because of all it tells us about the cross centuries before it happened. Remember the very first prophecy in the Bible was a prophecy about the cross. Talking to the devil, God said, I'll put enmity between you and my followers represented by the woman and between your descendants or seed and hers and one particular descendant of hers will crush your head though you will bruise his heel. That's Genesis 3.15 and then the Bible expands it until you get to Isaiah where there are whole chapters enlarging on that. But now don't ever forget what I'm going to say next. You never find a Hittite walking the streets of Brisbane or New York or London or Tokyo. The Hittites were once as prominent in the world as Britishers and Americans are today. They re ruled a huge empire for centuries, but they don't exist anymore. Babylonians don't exist anymore. Edomites, Moanites, Ammonites, none of these exist anymore. But the Jews exist and this is the point. From the very first book of the Bible, it was predicted that someone from this very tiny nation that would outlive the Babylonians, outlive the Hittites, outlive the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, etc., etc., that someone from this tiny nation would once bless the whole world. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to look at Genesis 22. This on its own is enough to prove the supernatural origin of the Bible. So please note what I read. <clears throat> I'm in Genesis 22 and I'm reading from verse 18. <clears throat> God is talking to Abraham, the first Jew. He says, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. How could it be? A wandering band of nomads who lived in tents and looked after sheep. How could it be that someone from those no-hopers, they weren't among the rulers of the world, they were nobodies. And yet here was a prophecy that someone from among the Jews would be a blessing to the whole wide world. Turn to chapter 26, please. God doesn't stutter, but when he repeats himself, it's important. Here in 26, verse 4, I'll make your descendants, talking to Abraham, as numerous as the stars in the sky. I'll give them all these lands, and through your offspring, 
all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me, kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, my laws. Now look at chapter 28. And now in chapter 28 and verse 14. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you'll spread out to the west, to the east, to the north and the south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. You remember in the book of Romans in chapter 4, it says that the whole world would be peopled by the descendants of Abraham because Abraham is the father of the faithful. He's just, not just the father of the Jews. He's the father of all believers in, in God. Father of the faithful. So here three times in the first book of the Bible, it says someone from this unknown tiny group that we call the Jews would be a blessing to the whole world. What a prediction. There's nothing like that in uninspired literature. When you come to the book of Isaiah, we've mentioned before that it's like a little Bible. There are 66 chapters, just as there are 66 books in the Bible. And it's in two divisions, 1 to 39, just as the Old Testament has 39 books, and then from 40 to 66, 27, like the New Testament. But from 40 to 66, 27 chapters, there are three books of nine chapters each. They each finish the same way. No peace for the wicked. No peace for the wicked. The worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. No peace for the wicked. So from 40 to 66, the last section of Isaiah, are three books of nine chapters each. Now get this point. In the middle book and the middle chapter and the middle verse is the central truth of Christianity. I want you to look at it with me in Isaiah 53. Would you kindly look? Isaiah 53. Recall that we're talking about <clears throat> Isaiah 40 to 66, three separate books of nine chapters each. And in each of those books, three lots of three chapters each. And now we're looking at the middle chapter of the middle book and the middle passage. Please look at verse 6. Here the Lord says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Go back to verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. This is the central verse. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. See what it's saying about you and me, <clears throat> that we're guilty of transgression, that we're guilty of iniquities, that we lack real peace and that we have wounds that need healing. 